ladies and gentlemen i think we are supposed to start at 5 am i correct okay so the new year seems to have brought a lesser number of applicants or prospective chartered engineers i don't know the reason because i have been doing this lecture for the last maybe 2 years this is the fifth or sixth time i am doing so the crowd is less maybe they have decided not to do the this question or they don't like my lecturing i don't know whatever reason okay we are here i am i am also pressed for time and you are on time so we should respect people who are on time so we will start this lecture uh, first this lecture i think uh, in the recent past when this series of lectures of uh, supporting the candidates who are sitting for the professional review examination this lecture series began about 10 years ago to my knowledge maybe about 12 years ago but again it restarted about 3 or about 2 or 3 years ago then uh, the first instance i think it, when it went uh, infrastructure the plan was to have a single lecture two hour lecture for telecom and energy infrastructure but when i started uh, it was purely on energy infrastructure we uh, if you had gone i don't know whether the past uh, webcast are still in the website there i be touched upon both the electricity and the petroleum net, uh, sectors but i was advised that you will be given a separate lecture on petroleum is it listed in the your uh, this thing I, i'm not sure but i will be covering electricity in today's lecture the electricity infrastructure in sri lanka my name is samita midigaspe i am attached to the ceylon electricity board and i have maybe about 18 or more than 18 years experience at cb so with my experience and what i have i learned and also from what i have gathered i am presenting today's lecture before going into the electricity infrastructure itself let us think of what is infrastructure why is infrastructure so important yatitala paskam ke infrastructure why is it so important to the engineers or to the society infrastructure is needed because almost all the services that the people of a country obtain utilizes this infrastructure and without infrastructure neither economic development no social development can occur social development is something different from uh, economic development where for example it is the pq li the physical quality of life index is a social indicator whereas gdp per capita is a economic indicator but even social of course the social uh, life or the social development can occur with restrictions on infrastructure but only up to a certain level if you don't have roads if you don't have power if you don't have mob mobile co in connectivity if you don't have bridges if you don't have full supply to your houses even the limited supply or a limited infrastructure then the social development also gets slowed of course the economic development we all know without infrastructure economic development is always not always uh, slowed down or there is no economic development where there is no infrastructure development so that is why infrastructure is important to the society then why are we interested in well the infrastructure and engineers are interrelated we design them we construct them and we maintain them so infrastructure and engineers cannot be uh, talked separately it's interlinked and of this infrastructure there are various type of infrastructure and with in, if you take energy also there are the, pet, the petroleum sector and the power sector are the, the is the basic uh, division that we can make before we go in uh, how many are there in the electricity sector here yeah please okay then petroleum sector okay roads construction other construction building services okay and if we take the another sort of uh, categorization private uh, enterprises working in private enterprises please i can so that just to get an awareness uh, direct government 
semi government okay we have a big mix of people here and we all are interested and we all have to learn something about the infrastructure in our country i will first touch upon give you uh, sorry the overview is not here so we will discuss the the a brief overview of the sri lankan power sector and also how it has developed the different generation technologies the future how future plans are being made at cb or in the power sector the major players in the power sector you must remember that cb is not the sole player in the power sector or the electricity sector and some statistics and also the major issues that are uh, could related to the power sector major issues in the power sector which we as engineers as professionals which i think most of these have been written or talked in many forums in newspapers and in uh, different uh, tv programs maybe but unfortunately not in a professional manner and more than 50% or almost 75% not true we all know if you know the your field what is in the newspapers or what is in the public media is always not the truth so we'll start with an overview of the country's power sector when i mean an overview this is something important for the engineers when you deal with a sector you must understand that sector where what are the figures main figures involved in this what are the players what are the figures and how it is connected that the infrastructure is connected either if you take the the roads how the construction planning or monitoring or how that is done if you take petroleum the transportation linkage from start from uh, fuel harnessing or from excavation refining up to distribution so that type of thing so that that understanding should be there what is this sector what does it do what are who are the the players what are the numbers and what are the issues and what are the possible answers one thing we should understand is there are no exact answers to these issues in our infrastructure related is this one correct or better than this or which is best all these are constraint in a mathematical question of course you have 2.33798 there is a under answer but in the engineering we all know it all depends on our assumptions we assume a safety factor we assume other factors and we assume a uh, ipv uh, sorry npv we assume irr we assume foreign funding we assume local funding all these things matter in engineering decision so it is always a uh, analysis under these conditions this and other conditions this and our role is to advise the policy makers on the better options based on our assumptions so it's our role to give the policy makers under these conditions we think this will happen or we can do this under these conditions we cannot do this but our uh, assumption is or our recommendation is this but remember the professionals or the engineers are bound by our uh, boundaries that is maybe our theories or the uh, rules and regulations that we are covered the finance in, in the government sector far the circulars or the engineering solutions sometimes the politicians might provide something out of the boundary because it's coming from the requirement of the society i am talking in the on a positive sense of the politics not the negative sense it's coming from when it's coming from the people it's when it's the requirement of the public that is what we are serving remember the engineers are serving the public in getting their work their services done in a better quality quality or a better or a economical manner in that way there could be demands coming from the public which will come from the politicians and they will then decide the policy framework should be changed so there are the changes from the politicians but it is our duty that within our frames what we think are the better options based on certain assumptions so that is what differs us and in this sense remembering numbers i said that you need to understand the players the start and the end of a sector and its issues and answers and the numbers when i say numbers we cannot remember all the sectors and all the numbers but the, it's the importance is remembering the at some uh, close figure or when i say 
We all know that the, uh, the area is six, 65,332 because we have sort of learned it by heart when we were in grade 1 or 2 or grade 5 or 6. But what we should know from that number is the size of our country is six, around 65,000 or more than 55,000, less than 100,000. So that is the range. We must have an understanding or a sense of the range. That is the important thing. So when we see that Australia is this much, 2 million or what, some sort of a uh, uh, size country, we know that we are smaller. In this, we are between 50,000 and 100,000. Maybe we are close to 75,000 if I remember correctly. Okay, 75,000, 750,000. Australia is, I don't know. I, I don't know whether Australia is 750,000. Okay, it is 1 to 10 times. Then, when we figure out, when we study some sort of a study, feasibility study or some sort of a analyzing report in Australia done about their highways or expressways or their transport systems or their railway systems, we know that we are comparing a large country with a small country. So that is why we, we need to have a sense of numbers. The exact figure, no. I also can't remember any of these exact figures of CB electricity or the Sri Lankan electricity sector. Anyway, most of the time when CEB publish the same data in two places, it's two different data. That I accept. But still, they are close to each other. The name, the name grade capacity, the planning capacity, the operational capacity, the actual capacity. All these differ. There are engineering reasons for that. But we all know it may be 49 megawatts, it may be 51 megawatts, it may be 53 megawatts, it may be 60 megawatts. It is around 50. It's not 500 megawatts. So that is what we should understand. So that is why I said Sri Lanka's capacity, you will see many figures. The dispatchable capacity that we are, when we take out, so, okay, I'll start from population. Population is 20.5 million, 21 million, maybe Central Bank now, the latest figure is different, but it is in the range of 20 million. That is what is important. Our per capita GDP is around 4,000 US dollars. Sorry, around 3,000 US dollars. I think this may be now around 3,500. And the installed capacity of Sri Lanka of dispatchable power plants, that is where we can dispatch, where energy is stored, where we can, you, the, the control center or the dispatch center can use, we, we will have some more slides on this, is around 3,400. So it's between 3,000 and 4,000. What is the peak? It's around 2,000. 2,164 is the recorded peak. So it's around 2,000. Sri Lanka has a requirement of around 2,000 megawatts at the highest level and we have a capacity of more than 3,000. So that is what we should have. It's 2 and 3, okay. Energy generation, this is uh, 2013, it was 11,962. You can't remember, it's more than 10,000, around 10,000, 12,000. So those are the figures that we should, it's, it's the important thing, the numbers, the ranges that we should have. The capacity and energy, I hope you understand the difference between capacity and energy. That is something and in, I think we have all learned, but capacity is measured in megawatts. It's the instantaneous thing. Energy is when power into time, when megawatts into time, megawatt hours, kilowatt hours, electricity units where we uh, build your house or your organization. That is energy. Power is instantaneous at a time, joules per second. That is what power is electricity, electrical power. So the difference is power is an instantaneous thing, energy is a continuous or a adding up of power. The capacity mix is 40% hydro and thermal 60%. Energy mix, this is the 2013 data, 60% hydro. You will see the estimated figures for 2014 and also the actuals for 2012 are quite different from that. Transmission and lo distribution losses, this is something uh, good that we are proud of as a country around 10.79 so that is around 11 or 10 electrification level around 97 percent per capita consumption 519 we can't remember all these things but just have the Sri Lanka's annual generation is in the range of 10,000 to 12,000 we need around 2,000 megawatts at the maximum demand is we all make a maximum demand of 2,000 for which CB or the national power grid has a capability of more than 3,400. So the population of the country is around 20 million. And the square, the area is 
around 60,000 square mil kilometers or more than 50,000, less than 100,000. So those are the things that I hope you get what I'm, what my point, that it's not the numbers per se, but the range that matters. Those things we have to understand. The capacity of CV, as of now, once again, I am here putting up only approximate figures, not the exact figure. If you want the exact figures, you can go to the CB website. There, the statistical digest, the data is available only for 2013. There, are the exact figures are there at 2163.7 or like that. Call 900 megahertz gross and a net capacity of uh, 825 around that range because three coal plants are there. Then, oil fire that is different types of oils furnace oil, diesel. Uh, There are about 1,100 and half of that is CB, half of that is IPP. IPP is private producers. Then the total thermal is 2,000. Total hydro is 1,350. It's once again an approximation. And when this is the total CB capacity is 3,400. Of course, you will say that when you add these two, it's 3,350. 3, but the actual the hydro is something around 1,371. So that is why at the total mark, I have brought it to 3,400. So it's basically uh, 2,000 to 1,350, maybe two-third and one-third, two-third thermal, one-third hydro, that is the capacity. Actually, it was 40% to be exact, 40% to 60%. And the non-conventional uh, renewable energy, which is basically mini-hydro, wind, biomass, solar, which we categorize separately because we cannot dispatch or we cannot start, run, load, deload, stop at the time that the system wants. They are dependent on the source intermittency. That is, mini hydro is dependent because there is no storage depending on the water flow. And wind is dependent on the wind at that stage. There are no storage facilities, storage methods. Same uh, solar. But biomass, of course, you can store. So we have to, it's not an intermittent resource, but still it comes under a non-conventional renewable energy. And the approximate total is around 400. So that is once again the present capacity. Now these are here somewhat exact figures. 3,366 is this is the total. So this is the difference. This is hydro. This is CB thermal. This is IPP thermal. This is coal. So this total makes uh, these added together makes this total. So this is the total capacity. And this is the total, the maximum demand that we have experienced. And this is the NCRE which we have separated, but which also supplies a sort of a part of our demand at a given time. It may vary from wind, maybe from 5 megawatts to 98, which is the maximum. And hydro, mini hydro also at dry years, almost zero, or, but up to 400, sorry, up to 300 megawatts. So that is the present capacity and the demand. So this is an interesting picture. You can note uh, this is oil, this is uh, coal, this is oil. You can take this hydro and non-conventional. This is renewable. So we can take this blue and yellow total as renewable. In 2011, it was only around, it made up around 40% uh, or maybe more than 40%. But here it was only 30 percent compared to 2011, 2012 it was down very much. This is 30 percent. And in 2013 the total was 50 percent past 10 percent. So renewables were 60 percent, hydro was 50. So that was a good year because of the weather conditions. And when 2013 was good, 2014, please remember this. Uh, NCRE figures are estimated for two months. We have not received the actual figures yet. So depending on those figures, once again, it is 40%. It has gone down from 60%, the total renewables to 40% this year, or 30% for hydro from 50%. Why? Because of the drought. We now don't remember 2014 as a drought year. We all now remember it as a flood with the, with the re recent floods. But unfortunately, people in the irrigation department, in the at MASL, 
would certainly remember those difficult months of the first eight months where I think uh, we failed uh, the previous Maha, the next Yala, that is the, as well as the monsoons, and both the water sector or the irrigation sector as well as CB had a problem. But of course, with the coal power plants in, the problem was not as bad as it would have been in 2014 from a financial or economic sense. The loss was less. And from a capacity wise, from the ability to deliver the power required, CB did not have any issue because there is adequate thermal capacity to replace the hydros. So the last year's figures are basically, we, previously it was 12 percent when there was only one coal plant available. Uh, two more coal plants came in April and August in 2014. So that has made up 26 percent coal, 30 percent from hydro and nine, so that is from uh, the NCRE sector, so oil making up around 30, 35% uh, CB and IPP oil. Still, it is 35% contribution that is in generation for 2014. So, if you remember, we'll go back to, to th from 2011, 2012, 2010, it's not here, was a very good year for CB because of the hydros uh, of the weather. Then 2011, it was around 40 percent, 12 down to 30 percent. I am talking about hydro, then it went up to 50 and now back to 30 percent. This is the variation of demand. We will talk about more this at the end of the lecture. So I, am, I will just tell you that this is the, in different years in the maximum peak demand day, the low, how, did, how the Sri Lankan demand the, f the load felt by the system uh, by the national grid or the national uh, system how much it has the variation throughout the day the hourly variation we will talk more about it the historical development of course uh, I did not I just went through it in the previous lectures but thought today that as we have two hours we will also talk a little bit about this historical uh, development uh, Sri Lanka was a country which sort of encountered electricity quite quickly or in par with the rest of the world. In 1882, first artificial ele electricity or electricity rather than from lightning was seen in Sri Lanka when a ship called Hel SS Helios sailed into the Sri Lankan to the Colombo port and had an electric exhibition. In 1895 or around these days a private company at that time also a private company put up a thermal power plant in Bristol building. It is said that the billiard room of the Bristol building is the first building in Sri Lanka to be the first place in Sri Lanka to be lit up. In 1912 in Blackpool, New Aurelia, uh, an engineer attached to the public works department with, the, uh, with some uh, discussion after putting up a paper with the uh, proposal with the government put up a small hydro plant in Blackpool, Norelia using the Gregory Lake water and the name of that engineer was Vimala Surendra, DJ Vimala Surendra. In the same period, thermal power plants were put up in the cities, built Paliaguda, Gampaha, Jayala, uh, made some from the municipalities, some from the uh, private parties. In 1918, engineer DJ Vimala Surendra presented his paper on economics of hydropower utilization to the Engineering Association of Sri Lanka, that is basically of Ceylon, IESA, in which he promoted utilizing our hydro resources. And that is what I think most of you would know of Engineer Vimala Surendra. That is that he put up the concept of Lakshapana power station or you know, the utilizing the uh, water potential at Kalniganga for hydropower. But, what is, but that, that is not the important thing from, I would like to uh, point out. Of course, as an engineer, he saw when there is a potential difference, there is a source of energy, there is an energy potential difference, and there is a technology which he would have surely known from his uh, studies abroad, etc., that you can harness electricity. But what is important is if you have time, of course, not for this uh, exam, maybe even for that, it will be useful. If you read, it, it's available in the web, I think, and it's also in the ISL library. So the extracts from it are available, and there are some books written about him, Engineer Vimala Surendra, is that how he 
proposed to utilize that electric city electrical power that is what is important he was not an engineering engineer per se or a designer per se or a technician per se he was a visionary that he sensed what it, electricity can be utilized he proposed in his paper that the railway should be electrified which we are still talking about writing so many papers and so many project proposals and political uh, manifestos have that railway elect will be electrified but engineer vimala surendra in 1918 in his paper said that there should be the railway should be electrified with regenerative braking not only that he proposed the industrial industrialization of the country and an example is that even he went up to the level of utilizing the electricity to manufacture electric uh, manufacture fertilizer so that is the important part of this it was a total proposal a project proposal utilizing an available resource to bring down bring up the social and economic development on the country that is a true engineering work and true engineering proposal then there were some uh, thermal power stations were started in 1950 the first major hydropower plant connected to the national grid lakshapana stage 1 was commissioned the kalanidhi steam power plant the first uh, major big large scale thermal power plant there have been many thermal power plants before that in 1974 the new lakshapana power station 76 ukwela that is the first mahavali in the mahavali basin uh, but it came not under the accelerated mahavali program but under the mahavali uh, i think the name was the mahavali development board if i am correct mahavali sangwardhana mandali or something and it was under that a joint effort between mahavali and cb the ukwela power station came up the accelerated mahavali came later the gas turbines at kalanidhi in 8 1980 and in 1984 victoria power station that is the first power plant to come up from the accelerated mahavali program in 1996 the first mini hydro power plant under the uh, standard power purchase agreement that is CB, where the energy is purchased at a standard price which is still going on the form, the format of the pricing the tariff methodology has changed but still the concept is the same whatever energy is produced by the mini hydro power plants are purchased at a given standard power purchase agreement which is not unique to each and individual developer all small power purchase agreements which are signed in the same year should have the same uh, rates so the first one came up in 1997 which is what what has developed now to almost 400 megawatts it has its pros and may have had its cons also in 2002 in 1997 the first independent power producer private thermal power producer came up in the form of lakdhana navy limited the difference between these ipps independent power producers which is the terminology used for these thermal power plant operators and the uh, standard power purchase agreement which is used for the uh, renewables is that renewables as i said have a standard power purchase agreement it may change by year it may change due to certain decisions uh, by the uh, government or the tariff decisions but not by individual uh, power producers but the independent power the ipp the thermals are based on diff different price contracts different producers have different contracts with cb so that is why it is called ipps and the others are called spps in 19 in 2002 the first combined cycle plant of uh, cal uh, was commissioned which is the cb scalaris combined cycle followed by the aes scalaris in 2011 the first coal power plant the lakwiche power plant in norachole putlam 300 megawatts gross connected 2012 upper kotmali of course this coal power plant came after a long delay the start of coal power in sri lanka was is, was in time around 1981 82 even the 1982 or 83 uh, cb plants had a coal power plant i think for the period of 1980 90 or something like that with a small size coal power plant 100 megawatt or 150 megawatt in 
the reconnection of the north to the national grid with the Chunnakam power station and the Chunnakam, uh, sorry, uh, Kilnochi Chunnakam transmission line construction. And in 2014, the full capacity of the 900 megawatt coal power plant was commission so that is just a bit of historical development and if you take uh, the organization it it was first uh, private producers private parties private companies which supplied electricity then municipalities the first centralized government organization was the uh, and then the government had its uh, electricity work under the public works departments electricity section or something like that in 1927 or around that time the department of government electrical undertaking dgeu was established and in 1969 it was converted to a board salon electricity board and in the late 1970s or early 80s leco lanka electric company which is a uh, organization under the uh, companies act you know incorporated under the companies act of course the shares are owned by government and semi government agencies including ceb local authorities was put up to mainly to take over the uh, supplies or the power distributions of municipality and other local government agencies and of course the other players we will talk in, in this this is just for information the hydrothermal share in 1990 if it was a good year we could supply even a hundred percent with hydropower but you would see that there are jumps with the increase of capacity, there is a in the increase in the generation capability energy. But year by year, you have seen with the increase of the demand, we have had to jump into increased thermal power producing, that is oil. And this part is coal since 2010, 2011. So this is just to show you how the hydros are in 94 around this time. This increase is due to Samalalava coming into operation. In 2000, after 2003, Kukule, some inclusion has increased, and now the capability has increased from around 2010 with Upper Kotmale Commission. Actually, it was in 2011 or 12. So now, maybe at the highest, at a highest year, this would go a little bit high, but not more than that. And almost all possible uh, hydropower potential in the country has been utilized and only a few are left which are at the moment under construction or development which we will I will talk to you. Next comes institutions in the sector. The Ministry of Government, uh, the Power and Energy is the policy making body. It represents the government. It represents theoretically the people. It is where the policy and the fund control if it is government funds coming from. Ceylon Electricity Board <coughs> is a government owned board and it's, it has the monopoly of transmission. Transmission if you would understand is high voltage transfer of transportation of electricity. It's a monopoly with CEB and in addition CEB has hydro and thermal generation and also distribution. There are other government owned companies or CEB subsidies in the sector. One is LECO, which I talk, talk to you. The others are, for example, Lanka Transformers Limited and its subsidies. Lanka Transformers Limited is partly owned by CEB and other its employees. So the subsidies, the subsidiaries. Then the IPPs, that is the private power producers pro providing thermal power on individual contracts to CEB on long term take or pay contracts where the investment is assured you have to remember that the model that C Sri Lanka has adopted for private power is that their investment is secured by a fixed term contract where uh, we have the fixed component and the, in the variable component of their return of, their, of an annual pay if their power plant is available for dispatching whether it runs or not their investment is recovered only when if it is if in a particular year if it is if it cannot meet the availability requirements that it is penalized the energy charge the cost of the operation cost is a pass through that is they are theoretically they cannot make a profit on the operation cost it is a formula charge plus 
uh, indexed for their other operation cost, maintain uh, O&M costs. So that is the operation. That is basically like if you hire you hire a car or you get uh, buy, hire a vehicle where you pay a fixed cost as the lease, and for the diesel you pay yourself. Something like that. It's in that model that the IPPs are running in Sri Lanka. Then there are other private generators, especially the uh, non-conventional renewable energy producers who are on standard power purchase agreement, as I told you. That is, they are below 10 megawatts. Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority is also linked to the power sector because they are the promoter, developer, and regulator of the renewable energy sector in Sri Lanka and renewable energy sources. The resources are, uh, according to the SLSC Act, are owned and the right and responsibility of developing them lies with the SLSCA. Of course, PUCSL is the main body in this in the sense of regulating. It's the regulator. I think most of you know about the TRC, the telecom regulator. Like that, and also we know about the Consumer uh, Affairs Authority, which is the basic regulator for uh, general kinds of consumer goods. Like that. The power sector has its own regulator, that is the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka, PUCSL. And the tariff passing, as well as norms and the regulations for the power sector are set upon by the PUCSL. Now I talk to you about the players. Now from a regulatory or a legal view of the sector, I will just give you some information. The acts relevant, the sector is governed by the Sri Lanka Electricity Act number 20 of 2009 act number 20 of 2009 replaced the sri lanka Elect the, the electricity act number 17 or oh no i can't remember number 50 of 1950 which was the act which regulated the sector so the sri lanka electricity act number 20 of 2009 gives out how the sector should run who has the authority to do what with regard to electricity generation transmission distribution use tapping uh, theft, everything, how it is set out in this Act, Sri Lanka Electricity Act number 20 of 2009. The CBN, it was amended in 2013, I have just mentioned for your information. Uh, Ceylon Electricity Board Act, CB Act number 17 of 1969 is regarding how the CEB issue is the internal acts of what can CEB do, what it cannot do from a sense of an organization within. Then the PUCXL Act number 35 of 2002 is how the PU, what is the organizational aspect of PUCSL. The main act of all here is the Electricity Act number 20 of, 19, of 2009. Under that, the regulator is PUCSL. The policy maker is government and government is represent, uh, represented by the Ministry of Power and Energy. So the Ministry of Power and Energy can, on behalf of the government, set out a policy guideline to the regulator. When setting a tariff, CB will go for a certain tariff increase or a tariff di division or a tariff change, it could be. And then the regulator can check that or compare that with the government policy setting. The government may say that a below the poverty line people should get a certain uh, subsidy, this amount of subsidy. And according to that, the regulator will set the tariff. So the policy and the and that the action of CEB is brought together by the regulator in its tariff decisions and, and other things. Then the policy maker, as I said, is the Ministry of Power and Energy. Then the, under the Electricity Act number 20 of uh, 2009, as I said, who can do what in the sector is specified. There is a requirement of license for everything or at least when the act was in its original form of the number two, uh, in 2009, you could not have your own generator supplying your home even without approval or a license from the uh, PUCSL. But PUCSL can exempt certain parties of having, and li having a license. So I think that part has been either exempted or, or uh, the, that anomaly has been uh, taken off, uh, has been directed by the Amendment Act. In that way, whether you generate or transmit or distribute the regulation you have according to the regulator you have to obtain a license from uh, PUCSL 
And the transmission licensee, according to the Electricity Act also, there can be only one transmission licensee in the country and it specified that CEB has to be the transmission licensee. Because Sri Lanka's power sector reform, you would have heard of this power sector reform, sector reform, unbundling of CEB, uh, even in the petroleum sector this happened to some extent, in uh, the power sector also this happened to some extent. Originally it was envisaged that the vertically integrated CEB will be uh, divided into certain parts, generation, transmission, distribution and put up as government owned companies or uh, strategic business units or in different forms. But whatever, if the model was single buyer model that the transmission company will buy every buy power and sell power. So it, and ultimately it will be in the government hands. That was the original uh, sort of model that was in the power sector reforms. And that has that is reflected in the present where the uh, sector reforms has not gone to that end. It is government owned single organization still monopoly to certain extent but regulated by the regulator with licenses. So even in the act it is said that the transmission license is given to CEB and it has been given now for a 15 year period. Generation license, anybody who generates and connects to the national grid has to get a license definitely from the PUCSL. So CEB has its own license for its power plant, the IPPs whether it is uh, AES Kalanidis uh, or the Asia Power or whatever, it also has to get a uh, lic license from the regulator. Not only them, the small power producers below 10 megawatts who are connected to the national grid, they also need a license. Distribution license, only five issued. CB has four, two different, four supply, four different geographical uh, areas of the country, which we call regions. And four, there are four CB divisions which look after them. In CB, we call them the distribution division one, two, three, and four. So, to the geographical areas where they are looking after have their own license. But still, it's the CB which has the license, and the other licensee is LECO. Okay, now we have sort of gone into the, looked at the sector from a macro viewpoint. We know that the power, the Sri Lankan power sector is, has CB as a main player, but of course there's the regulator. And also there are IPPs, the private parties, and there are also small power producers supplying power. And that uh, see Sri Lanka's power, uh, the energy generation, still uh, has many sources, coal, oil, different types of oil, uh, hydro, and also the other renewables, especially wind and mini hydros. And we also know that the hydrothermal contribution, thermal contribution has been increasing. Recently, the oil, coal has also come into the picture and that in the future, the thermal part, coal will be the major fee uh, player. We also know that our capacity, Sri Lanka's capacity is in the range of 3,400 in megawatts, but that our requirements is around 2,200 or 2,000. We also know that hydro is around 1,400, others are thermal. We know that IPPs have around 550 of the thermals of the oil, that the coal is owned by CEB, and that the energy generation in 2013 was around 12,000, close to 12,000 megawatt. 12,000. <coughs> gigawatt hours <coughs> that the transmission and distribution loss is in the range of 10 to 11 percent. You, you understand what this transmission and distribution loss or the system loss is. We all have I think done our basic electrical when uh, electricity is conducted through a conductor we all know that when a current passes through a conductor there is the Ohm's law said that there is a power loss energy loss to the uh, environment of I squared R. So whether we even if CB, it's CB who is transferring this energy or the power through its long transmission lines, that I squared R loss does happen. So that is part of it. That's a technical loss. And it is unavoidable, but you can bring it down. We all know that you can make the conductors large, but we actually what we can make is resi the lower resistance or lower reactance that can be done by improving the network. That is one part. Then the other part, and also transmitting by higher voltages. The other part of the losses is uh, the non-technical, the commercial loss. That is the nice way of saying is, the other thing is fraud or theft, tapping. That has also been brought down from, so the 
in the time of around year 2000 2002 if i remember correctly the cb losses in the sector the system losses were in the range of 20% we have now been able to bring down with network improvement plus uh bringing down the tapping of roads and with the uh, close investigations to around 11% which is in the south asia definitely best even in southeast asia that's a good figure world's best it says said to be in korea which is around 5% and of course we can improve a lot but that costs this improvements does cost that is what we have uh, talked about so far so i will now just show you the single line diagram of a power transmission network just to show you what it consists of power is generated in a generating plant it is transmitted in the conventional you know conventional power system and then brought down to a distribution line and to the customer for example power is generated at a comparatively low voltage around 11000 volts or 12500 volts in that range that is 11 kv or 12.5 kv but for transportation purpose it is then uh converted or to a higher voltage using transformers for transmission as i said when it is at high voltage high voltage transmission the losses are less so that is done at the power station itself so if we take a hydro or a thermal uh general power plant this is the generator this is the transformer we have we convert the voltage up to 2 220 kv and these are the transmission line so this is what we call transmission and then it may be brought down to 132 kv volts in sri lanka there are two transmission voltages 220 and 132 kv this is also a similar plant but this is connected generator transformer connected to a 132 kv network and the 132 kv network there's the grid substation the grid substation is basically what we can say is something like your wholesale stores where the high voltage is brought down to medium or lower voltage but not the distribution voltage from a grid substation it is brought down to 33 kv and then to a primary substation we we may have different names so this is 33 kv this is medium voltage or low L medium voltage distribution then from 33 kv it may be 11 kv or like in this distribution substation 33 kv to 400 so this is the, these are the transformers that you'd see in, on your electricity poles pole mounted transformers now basically used for 33 kv to 400 and this is basically your retail store near your home this is basically like the wholesale store the energy is generated transmitted and here again converted to low voltage and it may go as 33 kv and supply to bulk consumers on 11 kv and to residents it will give go as 33 kv and using the 33 to 400 transformers near your houses the distribution substations the residential consumers will be served so this is the conventional system but with the renewables coming in especially the intermittent renewables wind mini hydro they are connected not that mostly at high voltage levels but at 33 kv kv levels so they may be connected here something like at 33 kv so they may not go beyond this but depending on the time and their generation the power may flow directly to the supply to the customers or may go through the transmission lines to other uh, customers in other grid substation so basically this is the transportation of electricity from generation right down to the consumers the transmission lines and then the grid substation the generation the high voltage transmission then bringing down to medium voltages then through the main stores or the wholesale stores which we call the grid substation then the medium voltage distribution and then to the, through the retail to the retail customers this is of course uh, the mahaveli complex of the irrigation and the mahaveli people will know it even better than us but the basic thing is the mahaveli river 
the normal flow is this way and at Polgolla there is a diversion and before Polgolla there are two power plants already upper Kothmale and Kothmale and the Moragolla a small power plant of 30 megawatts is now almost uh, starting to be constructed plants are already and the diversion is at Polgolla when it is diver uh, before with, if it is not diverted it goes through Victoria Randeligala Rantabe and it goes to the Madhuroya and Mahaveligaga different goes to Mahaveligaga and also the Ulitira Kida schemes and if it is diverted this water will go to Suduganga and then through Abang from Ukwela tunnel the Ukwela power station here then the Bhavatana power station to Abanganga and there are of course the water diversions down Bhavatana I think uh, at Alahara if I am correct I am not sure down to Giritale then there is the other anicots to Parakrama Samudraya and down to Mahavalingaga. So the converter, uh, the diverted water will go to the large Rajarata uh, region areas for irrigation and other purposes. If not diverted, it will go through Victoria, Rantabe, Randinigala and Rantabe. Now here is a good question or a good issue which I think uh, some take it as uh, electrical engineers versus civil engineers so CB versus MAS, CB versus irrigation the issue is the diversion how much should be diverted but it should not be tackled in that way it is a social and economical question if you put it purely to uh, figures one unit of water whatever we will say one MCM of water going through here the amount ok like this if one unit of electricity can be produced from a certain amount of water which is going through this there are two power stations Ukwela and Bovatan through the diversion for irrigation purposes if it produces one unit of electricity if it is sent through this scheme we can produce two and a half times electricity here so from CEB's point of view or from a power generation point of view sending any water down here is a loss because if we can you generate we are set generally the agreement is around 875 MCM if I, if I can send 875 MCM I don't figure how many gigawatt hours we can make two and a half times gigawatt hours can be made sent here so the amount we are sending here has to be replaced by thermal power which we have to this resource has to be imported for which we have to use dollars so what and if we take the financial pure financial point uh, figures some time back there was a study where it was shown that even if we paid the farmers here for not farming the amount of lost uh, opportunity by the amount that we can estimate from that they will get from the paddy cultivation if we see we paid still this is from a uh, financial perspective this is uh, profit making so you, is it correct what is correct should we do that should we increase and there is a tremendous in, uh, request with the proposal proposed increases in agriculture here and paddy cultivation here for increased water diversion that means decreasing the uh, generation here and replacing that with thermal <coughs> <coughs> which one is correct should we increase should we leave it like that of course you cannot say off hand it, and it is not only pure uh, a technical number it is not a financial issue because the whole social strata or a social life depends on this paddy cultivation and also this is not purely paddy cultivation it is the food security of the country which depends on it. so it is not a pure financial calculation it is an economic calculation of course there are uh, pros and cons for both sides which we have to analyze and agree upon and also one may ask if the country is now self sufficient in paddy should we utilize this water to for commercial cultivation increase of water diversion for commercial cultivation so here it's commercial cultivation if paddy is self sufficient should we use this diversion for commercial cultivation we try to use commercial cultivation then it becomes a more financial or economic aspect the social aspects are less whether that commercial activity is better or and thus 
utilizing our ha very difficultly earned petrodollar dollars for to import oil or coal is that correct food security and paddy is one thing commercial production is one thing so this question this issue has many facets it's a multifaceted one so these are the things that engineers when you as engineers when you come up in your ranks when you come up your ranks and also when you are studying these aspects the economic and the social aspects of our engineering calculations too have to be looked at this is a compelling issue that the power sector is facing throughout with the irrigation sector there have been fights there have been analysis there have been feasibility studies there have been so many even the recent uh, dam safety project of mahavali let's see so what should we do so th those are the things that we have to analyze when you are analyzing those are the the questions the economic social and the engineering aspects of course engineering aspects touch upon both economics and social so it's not pure financial it's not pure rupees it's not pure dollars per kilowatt hour it's not pure rupees per paddy kilo you have to think in all aspects not purely on uh, paddy cultivation so that is on mahavali laksapan of course is mainly utilized for uh, i forgot one thing about mahavali there's going to be a trans basin diversion with the umawaya where uh, the water from the uh, umawaya power station and this of course the water will not come to umawaya it will be the water in umawaya umawaya is a tributary of mahavali and at present it is uh, falling into randinigala but in the future when it is diverted at uh, valimada near dairaba and polpola the twin reservoirs the water will be transferred to vellavaya and to the kirindioya so it's a trans basin diversion so that is another aspect that people think is trans basin diversion correct is the power plus irrigation and all the irrigation and power agricultural benefits does it warrant this kind of trans basin diversions laksapana complex is a uh, little bit it's not very much of a multi uh, use but of course it has i can you can say the kalambu water supply is basically dependent on kalambu when i mean kalambu the abathale water supply and the water supplies in avisavela and that area also is purely dependent on that these two reservoirs in Maskelio ya dama, Mausakali and Kehilgamoya Kasuri Reservoir. These are the two main reservoirs in the Kalaniganda. In the dry season, the water requirement of Kalambu, the domestic water supply, the town water supply is purely dependent. There's, this is these are the only storages available as of now. Of course, it's uh, when the water manage in the water management secretariat when these all, all these organizations meet. The priority is of course for drinking water first. then irrigation then comes power that is sri lanka's which is of course correct if you take it in that way and uh, even in mahavali the kotmale water is the uh, source for town water supply for kandi and katagastura that areas that is the storage this is the valavi basin we have the uh, samalavava and udavalavi here and uh, the new power plant broadlands which is under construction is also coming up and it will be the lowermost power plant in kelniganga We, are, we started from with this old laksapana power station stage 1 25 megawatts diverting water from kehilgamoya to maskelioya and here both will be tapped in the broadlands power plant which is under construction and expected to be completed in 4 or 5 years so that is the present generation system i will just upon, touch upon the present transmission system also this is the present transmission system basically what is in green are the 132 kv lines i am not sure whether you can see can you at the back see the green lines okay so that this is the transmission network you can see that it is centered upon the central hills because our hydro power plants are there and goes radially throughout the country that is to the load centers and our main load center is the southwest of sri lanka more than 
60 to 70 percent of our load is in this region. So that is why so many lines connecting central provinces here. The 132 kV is in, in my one it is pink but it is purple. It is connecting the Mahavali with Colombo and with Anuradhapura and with uh, Putlam, the two main centers of uh, generation is connected with the load center. I will stop here and the time is 5 past 6, uh, this one also 6, shall we begin as soon as possible, 6.15 is my time because I also need to go early, right, you have a tea break now, thank you.
ี่ใช่ไหมครับเพื่อนอย่างที่ท่านบอกที่นี่ก็ต่างๆที่ไรก็ไม่ได้ตัดสินใจเลยที่ท่านที่ไม่ได้ส่งผลกันคนเดียวเอ้ยแค่ไหนแต่ทำไมเดินน้ำเบนน์นี่สิเลมาเกี่ยวกับที่บุนน้าครีเคสเเ
Okay. Shall we restart? Right. The generation. Now, as usually, an engineer should be able to utilize the resources available. So, I may be not doing it in a proper engineering way. The resource of time is getting out of hand. So, we'll quicken to through some of the slides. Generation technologies, of course, more information is available at CB website. So, these are basically the. Uh, Sri Lanka is abundant with uh, many technologies and many fuels that we have starting from coal steam which uses coal to diesel engines which do not use diesel but use uh, furnace oil. These are different technologies that CB uses. The cost of production for investment decision we all know that we have to not to only to take uh, the decide in a factor is not only the capital cost or the operation cost. Both has to be taken care of, have to be analyzed in taking a capital, uh, taking a cost decision regarding investment that is basically on transmission lines and mostly on generation plants because generation plants are highly capital intensive. For example, the a coal plant of the nature of uh, 900 megawatts is around in the range of 900 million US dollars or 1 billion, so in, in that range. A hydropower plant of three uh, of Upper Kothmale may be more than 300 million, maybe 400 million US dollars. This depends on the geographical conditions of hydropower plants. So, when making investment decisions for future power plants, which one is to select for which year? It all depends on the demand and the projections of the future, but you have to consider both the capital cost and variable cost. That is, for new projects, you have to consider both capital and it's like uh, what you call the cost accountancy in cost accounting principle for project financing you you have to decide con consider both the capital cost and the variable cost in the variable there is the energy cost or the fuel cost and the o and m cost and there is also a fixed o and m cost which i am sure you would know the difference between the variable o and m and the fixed o and m and the fuel cost basically uh, the capital cost is there and there is a variable cost and the fixed o and m cost which are capital cost at the initial stage, the other two the variable o and m and the fixed o and m throughout the years. So, these two have to be uh, analyzed when making a de an investment decision because <coughs> just because depending on the uh, capital cost or depending on the full cost you cannot make a decision. Cap uh, for example, I have uh, from the least uh, cost generation plan, the long term generation expansion plan report of CEB. I have some figures. This is also just for indications for you to just to have an understanding. A coal 300 megawatts, the capital cost is dollars per kilowatt. Take a kilowatt tax for the capital cost, take a dollar key. Uh, in a 300 megawatt coal plant, it may be around 1500 or even 1900 depending on sites. A gas turbine is 473. We, we can com compare these two. And the Morocco hydropower plant, the, after the latest uh, final detailed design, the cost is 4448. Capacity is 30 megawatts. So the dollars per kilowatt is around 4000 dollars per kilowatt. So the capital cost varies. For the, in the thermal plants, because hydro and thermal, you cannot compare. Those are two different things. If you take thermal, the gas turbine is in the range of 400 to 500, while a coal is in the range of 1,500 to 1,900 dollars per kilowatt. If we take fuel cost, if crude is at 110, diesel at 128, so think of crude as the platform or the base. If crude was around 110, the others would be in this range even coal and even LNG because this is high oil prices. High. At that level, a diesel uh, cost for gas turbine, US cents. But I am, so here I am comparing the full costs, the energy cost per kilowatt hour, the amount of uh, full cost per electricity unit generator. That previous one was for the capital cost per kilowatt, per kilowatt hour for a diesel, for a gas turbine it is 26. US cents for a coal power plant 
it is 5 US cents. See the difference. In the capital cost, it was more than 4 times. Or around 4 times, or 3 times definitely. Here, it is 5 times. On the other way, the, the operation cost of a, the full cost of a gas turbine is 5 times the cost of a coal steam. This gas turbine is a modern, uh, not, uh, I'm not here putting only planning prices, not actual operational prices. They will differ a little bit depending on some, there are some CB gas turbines of old technology where it, it costs around when oil at this diesel at 100, it may cost even rupees 60 per unit because of their low efficiency and such like. So, what I want you to do is not these specific figures, but the difference. Coal power, the, the, there are base load power plants, so there are certain technologies which, which have a high capital cost. Certain technologies have a low capital cost. And when you compare the fuel cost or the energy cost, because of the fuel they use and because of the efficiency of the power plants, this fuel cost differs. So, when you are making an investment decision, both the fuel cost, capital cost, then there is one more thing to think that matters. That is the time of money. The, as you know, the, the, the value of money, the time of value of the money, whether money is used today and another time, the, money is, the, the value of money is different. So, you have to discount that to compare. The rupees today cannot be compared with rupees in 10 years time. So, you have to make a discounting. So, when you are comparing, you have to compare the fixed cost, take account the energy cost, the variable cost as well as the time value of money. So we have to discount that. This is an example of such a method where we have factored in the capital cost, we have factored in the operation cost and you would know that depend then we have brought the cost per kilowatt hour both capital and the uh, energy cost are both put in and because of that the time value is also there and depending on the amount of uh, units that it generate, you would understand the cost per kilowatt hour differs because the capital cost is the same. If you run this plant for 100 units or 1000 units, if it is capable in this year, the cost per kilowatt hour will change because the capital cost is the same. That is why these costs are coming down of all plants with the increase of plant factor. Plant factor is uh, annually the amount of uh, the percentage of uh, energy that it has delivered compared to its ability. If the power plant can generate 1000 gigawatt hours, 1000 units, if it generates 90, uh, if it generates 900, it is a 90 percent plant factor. That is what plant factor is. From its capability of energy generation, how much it can generate. So, if you would say that with increase of energy, all plants, the uh, unit cost comes down, the kilowatt hour cost. But these are coal plants. Here at lower plant factors, below plant factors, there are other power plants rather than the coal power plant, maybe the LNG combined cycle, maybe even if it is less than 0.5, things like gas turbine will emerge. That is the cost per kilowatt hour. With the base load power plants, that is the high capital intensive power plants like coal, nuclear or even hydro becomes uh, economical if they are used maximum when the usage is high because the full cost is low it is, it is the initial cost that is high this is like a petrol car and a diesel car that is the easiest example to remember if you are using uh, if you are using your vehicle every day to go to work to market and if you are running it uh, out station doing field work and everything definitely you will buy a diesel car even though at a higher capital price cost because its operation cost will set off that difference in the capital cost in the long run. But if you are using that only to go to the temple in Poe Day and to the market in Del Kadapolo on Sunday, two, five times a month, 10 kilometers plus 10, 50, 20 kilometers a month, you park it there with the permit and all that uh, in the part. But you, there you will not buy a diesel vehicle because that initial capital cost you cannot save by the operation cost because your usage is low. So, some sort of a similar decisions are made in the power sector also depending on the demand that is expected. 
there are certain amount of demand that is delivered by the base load power plants there are certain amount of demand which is delivered by the peak load power plants i would show further in the when we come to the demand curve different tariffs of course you all know there are different tariffs in sri lanka for domestic and religious categories there is the energy charge and fixed charge i will not go into deep i would just like to note to you that uh, the time of day tariff has been introduced to higher usages in both uh, general purpose that is the commercial and industry uh, as well as hotels the time of day tariff has been introduced that time of day means according to the time of day there are three uh, time slots the day is divided the amount the unit charge differs at the peak time where there is a heavy burden on see on the system there the load is high the cost is high this like other uh, peak uh, any other consumer good if there is the demand is high during the you know in the christmas season certain the cake ingredients price goes up <coughs> and during the muslim festival season the price of uh, ratayri goes up like that in the similar manner Uh, the power is also the time is on the time of day tariff at the peak time it is high at an off peak it is very low <coughs> in the middle time it some <coughs> thing in between so that is done to encourage people to shift from the shift away from the peak because at the peak time cb is operating high operation cost power plants like gas turbines and also recently in the general purpose and industry tariffs a new tariff category of below 300 megawatts uh, 300 uh, units was introduced under the budget uh, proposals that is to encourage small entrepreneurs then you would know that the energy charge and the fixed charge is only charged that are in the normal domestic and religious categories the uh, the if ac the full adjustment charge is no more it has been take, uh, taken off but in the high category the uh, high consumption category there's more than 42 kv a time of day tariff applies in the both in all hotels or in a uh, general purpose or industry there is the energy charge fixed charge as well as the maximum demand so that is basically tariffs the current electricity tariff please if you want you can see it in both the pucsl and cb websites this is cost of production and cost of sales just to give you an indication because we will discuss some issues there plan development both the uh, development of uh, cb carries out long term generation expansion plans now maybe more than 50 years that is for the for the remaining 50 years or 20 years as a rolling plan every two year or every one year this is changed and a generation plan is published a, tra a transmission plan uh, and that uh, generation plan is made based on the demand forecast at a macro level based on the macro de uh, demand macro economic forecast that are made by the central bank and other sources the cb uh, forecast a demand and to that demand to match that demand the generation planning is done and on the other hand there are the micro demands to which the distribution network makes a 50 a 5 year or a maximum 6 year plans the transmission plan is made to fix both to the, the demand coming from the distribution sector as well as the generation that is coming from the generation plan to cater to both the generation is predicted in a macro level the distribution demand is uh, uh, forecasted in a micro level at this areas or provinces and with and to match both these plans the transmission plan is made so that the grid substations and the transmission lines are made to connect these generators with the loads so that is the basic uh, and the generation planning is done at the le the basic principle of uh, uh, the sri lankan power planning generation planning is least cost least cost planning under the given technical uh, under the given uh, technical con uh, considerations and this least cost is to the economy you have to understand not to ceb so there are there is a discrepancy of it's a economic plan not a financial plan and this has sometimes made uh, bad eff effects on the ceb's balance sheet plan generation under construction there is the umawaya and broadlands funds are committed for morogolla hydropower plant and uh, fund sourcing and designing is going on for trincomalee coal power which is a joint venture with the indian uh, similar type of indian government owned company the ntpc 
uh, in Tricomalee and there is a MANA 100 megawatt wind which is by CEB both this the funding and the design initial stages so the wind plant is in the initial stage the Tricomalee joint venture has gone to a certain extent but it is still sourcing funds. Feasibility studies are being carried out for different types of coal technologies advanced subcritical coal then there is the use of LNG pump storage as well as nuclear. These feasibility plans are at different levels that is for the future. The transmission network of 2023 I will skip that and I will come to key issues in the power sector because this is something we are discussing. One is the delays in implementation of power projects. The mess in the power sector that we have experienced in the past maybe 10 or 15 years is basically because of a delay in implementation of expected or planned power projects. There have been plans but at implementation level it has got delayed. But there are reasons that there are preventable reasons were there and also unpreventable reasons that is when there is no funding and where there are certain issues in the country when there are fund sources are not coming you have problems of funding then the plants get delayed what happened is when the coal plant was planned for mid 90s or 2000 but when the plan when the coal plant get delayed what happened was oil power plants had to be brought in to fill that gap until the coal plant, until the coal plant, until the coal plant. And the cost difference between coal and oil you would have seen. So that is the major reason. And why, why, what are the reasons in delays in implementation? One is of course funds. Funds are, were not there. Funds may have not been there. Difficulty of fund, sourcing funds. But not only that, there were throughout environmental and social agitation as well as the political will. The requirement was not understood. So that was one of the reasons. So that for infrastructure projects to get moved, of course there are the environment costs, but it's it's a matter of understanding the cost and <coughs> deciding on the uh, mitigation action possible and also <coughs> carrying out those mitigations with a good will, with a positive attitude and then implementing the projects. Once you decide on implementation, that needs political backing, that needs policy backing. When the policy backing and the political backing is there, then only the true problems of the people will come out. Otherwise, it's always covered up in political fights or in other uh, agencies who are fighting or who are putting forward their own agendas, not the people. Even in the environmental uh, sector, we would see that in Sri Lanka, our environment regulations are very good and for that there is a good side of it. We are having a good, uh, relatively good environment compared to India and China which are other developing countries. But on the other hand, our regulations and environmental laws and all this are at the initial stage. When we are putting up a project, when the feasibility study is done, when the pre-feasibility study is done, during the EIA, during the IEA, we put in with, with the, all the organizations that are coming into the scoping committees, we put up so much of barriers and so much of environmental regulations into it. But how much, once the project is implemented, how much of those have been monitored or evaluated or checked for their implementation? My opinion is rather than going to going into so detailed regulations or rules for with regard to environment for infrastructure projects it is better to have a loose guideline but be very strict for the implementation that is what is lacking in the country from a sense that is why factories are put up and there are so many issues that the public comes up after the factory is put up but until the factories come up there are so many delays it may be in for low investment it is it may not be a problem still for if it's a private party there it's it's a issue for them but for infrastructure projects that is a big case that is a big issue that's a big loss then the power sector's other issue is high cost of production <coughs> invariably with hydro resource coming to a close or, or optima, optimized use when we our full potential has been utilized we have to move into thermal and we do not have as of now thermal resources and thermal fuels we have to import. So whatever it is, our cost of energy or cost of electricity will be relatively high when we compare with other 
countries, other economies having its own energy sources. But in a comparative sense, we all know that the energy cost, the electricity cost was a very high component of our, if it, even if it was an industry, even if it was a commercial entity, or even if it was at our home. The bill, the power bill, the light bill was a very, very big issue as a percentage wise. But that amount, that percentage will come down with the introduction of coal because compared to oil, coal will definitely be cheaper. But that does not mean, don't take me in a wrong sense, that coal prices will not go up. It will go up. But the historical, that is the only thing we have, historical relationships and the projections for future, which says that always coal will be cheaper than oil. So because of that, when we compare our, maybe in five years time, maybe in three years time, when these price subsidies and all this gets better uh, sorted out, the uh, amount, the percentage that we feel, whether as an industry, whether as an organization, commercial entity, shop, kadayak, or githaran, whatever it is, the light bill influence or the amount will be lesser than what it was in the last 10 years or five years. So that high cost of production issue will relatively come down in the next years but in the power sector that was a big issue why when the cost of production is high cost of production is high you have to to make a profit or to make even you have to sell it at a high cost high price what has happened is the continuously governments have decided not to sell power at high prices and they have given subsidies either cross subsidies that is from top users or bigger uh, energy users bigger higher you end users from them take subsidy to the low end or cross subsidy from one sector commercial sector to the industry sector but at the end still that has not been enough and it's the government which has subsidized this what do you mean by the government cbs <coughs> the government is somewhere the government steps in with a loan CB is in a debt to petroleum corporation because we cannot pay OCB and to pay that CB takes a loan from people's bank so then the government's debt burden goes up there but in one, one way it alleviates the problem of the customer to some extent so that is a big issue that is an issue for us to discuss is it correct to subsidize the customer while making losses in the government sector or with losses to the government because that government loss has to be collected from somebody people's bank interest has to be paid or petroleum corporation anyway has to pay to pay that the government may be getting another loan from somewhere and to service that loan the government has to collect taxes so then the electricity user is being subsidized by the paripu Oh Allah, is that correct? So, the, but in another way, there may be people who are below the poverty line who need some subsidy. But we are all getting that subsidy. Below 60 units, there there is a different definite subsidy. But even for our bills, who use more than 120, the lower segments are subsidized. Is that correct? shouldn't be the able should pay it should not should on, not only the unable people or the, below the poverty line people who should pay so the, those are the issues of the economics and the social aspects of this issue and also there said the government is totally different the petroleum corporation the Pe people's bank cb all are in one pro uh, circle of debt cb in debt to petroleum and CB has taken a loan from OD, from People's Bank, and People's Bank has to earn interest, and to pay the interest to the People's Bank, the Treasury sends some money to go to the CEB, and the Petroleum Corporation is still in debt, and for Petroleum Corporation to raise the letter of credit, the government gives another guarantee, and the government's debt portfolio goes up. So this is a very circular figure. Of course, things are getting better. This year was relatively better. Of course, CB is making more losses this year compared to previous year because of the dry weather. That is another thing. But 
operational costs are coming down because of that things are getting better but still that situation is there there is in the energy policy there is a thing called cost reflective tariff the energy policy as well as the electricity act says that the aim is to make cost reflective tariff that is whoever buys electricity has to be priced at the cost and anybody that the government feels should be directly subsidized that is he, he may be given power coupons or something like that but unfortunately even though the policy and the act uh, says that what we have seen in the recent price revisions is somewhat different from that so whether we will be able to go in that way because price sensitivity makes the consumption also the energy conservation is also linked to that the lower segments of users will continue to use it if and will think of it as a right of them to have those 60 units at a lower cost it will be very difficult to move them from to a higher tariff another issue that cb is having is integration of inter intermittent renewables this is a issue that has raised been with all uh, power agencies throughout the world they have i mean it is very easy for a power sector organization to have that uh, load center one place generation large generation at certain places have transmission lines distribute power technically it's very easy and you have storages and the conventional power sources whether it is coal hydro oil gas it is stored as a resource when these intermittent things like mini hydro wind solar comes there is no storage and when the, a certain amount of a considerable if a considerable amount of wind power is there the system operators are looking at without they know that there is a certain load at 230 there are so, so much ac zone there should be some load but unfortunately that load is not there the controlling the frequency controlling machines are coming down the load is going down for one hour it's going down they cannot find out why then suddenly it goes up the, it may be because in the putlam region where most of our wind plants are there there is a increase in wind and a decrease in wind in other power plants when there is a requirement cb can ask this power plant is down we can ask the control operators can ask kotpale power plant now we need 70 megawatts please start up one machine and give me because the hydro machine can start up synchronized full load in maybe 10 to 15 minutes maybe 10 minutes five minutes even if the running not actually or the lakwicha power plant if it is running at a low power about 200 megawatts the operator will ask there is an increase of power please increase up to 275 it will take about an one hour or two okay and they will run it but we can't ask the wind power plant we need 60 megawatt of wind there are 98 megawatts of wind connected to the system we need 60 megawatt please come up no it depends on that but we should remember that that thermal is at a cost where the operation cost is we have to pay in dollars wind cost is not there. but on the other hand the, there is comparison the full cost is almost zero in a wind or a mini hydro it is operational actual cost if you take so that is why people say we should have more indigenous resources because the capital cost the operation cost is a bit low but on the other hand they have a high they have a certain capital cost without that cap, uh, capacity assurance conventional plants have the capital assurance capacity assurance but not the thermal wind power plants if a thermal power plant is there if it is not broken we know that we can get that capacity but a renewable power plant cannot give that otherwise other than a storage hydropower plant and still they have that capital investment and that capital investment has to be in dollars most of the time with whether if it is mini hydro it is comparatively less if it's wind it's very high about 90 percent of course as dollars outside the country even though the operation cost is not going as dollars the capital cost whether as a loan or a uh, direct investment we have to pay in dollars so these are things that we have to think about these are issues renewables indigenous renewables yes very good operation cost zero but then the technical problems then the quality of power we expect can we give it to what extent these are the issues that cb is facing now we talked about uh, the environment social issues in site locations difficulty in implementation of tariff of course that is because the public does not believe it 
what CB is saying. So I am putting a bit, little bit of PR into this lecture also, so that you will have a good faith in CEB. The conflicting policies. Sometimes because of government policies, public pressure, trends in the international arena have led to conflicting policies. One example is, I will be brief, is net metering and tariff. In the subsidies, if you can, I think you can remember in 2013, there was a big ha ho about the CEB price increase, which went to the courts, went to the PUCSL, the regulator, and the CEB price increase was not given in the way that CB wanted. There was a policy, government policy directive also that certain units should not be decreased and that uh, the top more than 180 units there was given a huge increase. And the balancing was that from that high end users there would be a certain amount of money flowing into the lower category and that CB meaning the government meaning the other people will not feel it. Now at the same end you know there is a very big renewable lobby. There is a very big support for renewable international. There are many people to give grants, loans, support, advice on renewable. And one aspect of is net metering. What a fine thing. Our own generators, we are generating to the nation at whatever given time. But is it only that? There was a, the, <coughs> the net metering concept is that you consume what you generate, especially the solar power plants, and give the excess to the grid. The financial way, what has happened is, it is profitable with that tariff for people who are consuming about more than 300 or 350 electricity units or 400 electricity units above that. That is who are who are paying in before this tariff uh, decrease last month. Uh, who are having a bill around 5,000 rupees to have uh, net metering, they have put up solar power plants and supply to the grid, excess power. So what is happening? The concept of net metering is that your bill is a net bill. The amount of energy that you have supplied to the grid minus the amount of energy you have taken from the grid. And you are billed only if you have taken a net energy amount from CEB. So what, ha what happens is with that net metering, with that solar cells, most of the people of the high-end consumers are producing almost their requirement or a very minimum they are getting at. And they are coming at the lowest end of tariff blocks, 620 blocks, 150 blocks. And CB is giving subsidized tariff to them now. And what, where is the required or the amount of money that we expected from that consumers to subsidize the lower segment? It is not coming. There is no money for that. So that will money is a loss to CEB or to the country and that has to come from the Paripu and Nala. So, so that is a conflicting policy. Encouraging renewable energy, good. Encar giving subsidy to the lower segment, good. But at the high end consumers finally have not given that subsidy money from, plus subsidy has not come. So th those are conflicting policies. Even in tax, there is that. In the power sector, CB is public image. That's the issue. Involvement of private investment. Infrastructure projects, the government needs funding or the CB needs funding. So, but, and in the private sector, there is so much of funds available. But for uh, major power projects, is private financing okay? How much is it okay? What amount of control should a private party have on a power plant? You would have seen in certain documents, politicians say that in the, during the last World Cup, when see Sri Lanka was having in 2011, that there was certain power plants went out, which we believe were due to technical faults. But most of them were private power plants. So if at a national requirement, if these power plants are not available, can we investigate why? What are the scopes? So those are the issues of private investment. And the amount of return, what is uh, the correct return for that for a, such an investment? Most of the investments have been made as of, of the private power plants now in, at the time of uh, when we had issue, security issues. Then the rate of return or the insurance of a loan was very high. But is it correct? But the prior, 
the agreements were, are done. We are paying on same things. So is it okay, the private investment? But on the other hand, the government is always having problems of raising, raising funds for infrastructure projects. So what is the correct thing? There are no definite answers. Renewable energy and integration, I talked to you about the intermittency issue. The main issue with, re with renewable energy integration is intermittency. Intermittency of the source and the uh, inability of the technology to or the inability of having, non having, not having storage. That is the issue. Now I will come as a final to the issue of demand curve. The demand curve, which I showed you, that is the amount of power required from the by the uh, consumers, the total, it has its dips and valleys. And because of that, the generation mix is highly influenced by it. And because of that, the low, the low most cost coal plants cannot be fully utilized. And high operation cost plants have to be used to supply the peak. And the peak is mostly due to commercial or domestic and commercial use, not due to industry. In other countries, especially developed or industrial countries, it is the industry which gives the peak, but not in Sri Lanka. Here is a wonderful picture where I can tell what you are doing. This is the morning, we are sleeping. The load, this is a typical uh, curve, maybe a little old. Now this is maybe around 800, this is around 600, uh, 750 years, not so old. We are all sleeping. Around so this is the, this axis is 24 hours every half uh, one hour, and this axis is megawatts the demand felt by uh, the system control center. So we are sleeping around 4:35. There is a sudden ramp because we all are getting up, putting on the switch, and putting on the rice cooker, and maybe also ironing. So that picks up six o'clock. We all switch off all those things and leave for work, and there is that dip. Then we all come to our offices, our factories, our commercial establishments, schools, if so. And so this load is coming up not from domestic, this is coming up from industry, from offices and establishments. So we put on the air conditioners, we put on the computers and put them up. So we are working and at 12, 12.30 there are some dips because there are some energy conscious people who put off, switch off their maybe the computer but mostly I think it's the machines which have been switched off which brings this dip. In previous times there was a peak around 2.30 or 3 also but now it seems to have gone off when we are making tea. And now we all go home, arrive at home there is the peak and this is around 1250 and from 17.30 by 19.30 CB has to ramp up right up to around 2000 from uh, 1200. So uh, around 30% increase within half an hour, maybe 40% increase within half an hour. When it goes to 2200 from 700, it is more than 50% increase. Sorry, more than 100%, it's uh, 1200 to 2200, almost 100% increase, or maybe 40 to 50% increase within half an hour. And we, during this peak, what does we do? How much productive work do we do? We put on this light, we put on the air conditioner and we put on the run repair and if you tell me that your ch child is working in this, I doubt it. So during that peak, we are as an industrialized or economic way, we are not making money but of course the TV channels, that is the commercial part of it and the commercial establishment are making productive uh, inroads into the economy. So this is the peak. Uh, three hours or three and a half hours around uh, hundred uh, uh, maybe thousand two hundred five hundred or okay, seven hundred and fifty eight hundred in that range it may be even thousand five hundred to thousand that is the amount of peak that we have so this is an issue for us because we have to have power plants which are totally should be able to supply this but most of them are not running during this time around 800 megawatts is running only during this time. So other times it is idle. That is why we need different types of power plants as well. They must, they will be very short 
high capital uh, sorry high fuel cost but low capital cost because they are they we are not utilizing them these are the sort of base load power plants which will be running throughout in the future it will be the coal power plants mostly and the must run hydros because there are certain hydros which we have to run because of irrigation requirements so we have an issue of this uh, changing demand in other countries it's not as pronounced as this especially when in a in a industrialized country in a de developed country this is a smooth one so they have uh, they can have they don't need so much of different types of machine and their base load plants can run throughout <coughs> our base load plants have to be deloaded sometimes which is not good for the machines and also we don't we can have, do not get the highest efficiency but still compared to other resources they are the especially the coal plants are Pro, uh, economical, but we cannot make the best out of them because of this inherent shape of our peak. I am just showing you how this peak has been filled. This is uh, maybe yes in 2012, so there was only coal, one coal power plant. So this is coal. This is Sapugaskanda, which is the lowest uh, cost CB thermal power plant, and then the IPPs because IPPs are running on certain uh, fuels. So this, this is the base load and in the peak we have to have CB power plants also uh, yes, these power plants are coming up here and certain hydros we are utilizing. So that hydros we cannot use in other types so we have to use the because we are keeping them from the peak and also and in the dry times when these hydros are not so much available they will be filled by mobile CB gas turbines, which are costly. So the base load power plants, if the line was more smoother, then the base load power plants could have had a more use, more usage. So what are the possible solutions? That is why we are so much talking about shifting the P. How can we shift the P? One of the ways is time of day tariff, as we said. So even for domestic people, high end users type of data tariff might come and you can you may decide that you will not iron or you will not uh, watch tv at that time because now there are other methods available we, i will watch tv in the morning using the rewinding of pure tv if that if that is a commercial advertisement and then they have, it will have a high peak tariff and then there may be another way of very low of peak tariff offering to industry Okay, there, there can be industries which are called upon. They will run only from say, for six hours or seven hours, eleven to six, uh, morning in the six. That is all. Seven hours running industry. That is also what is happening. I mean, that is the amount of time that we use in the morning also. So seven hours tariff, night day. That is all. But at a very cost. Operation cost of the coal power plant is maybe around five rupees or six, seven rupees. If we take the investment cost, we'll recover the investment cost from the others. The normal tariff. Will offer at eight rupees, nine rupees, eight rupees a unit to this tariff throughout. So that is one way that can bring industrial, no industry, heavy industry. But of course, with the heavy industry coming, there are the other issues, the environmental impacts, the cost of other goods, labor, cost of labor. Is it cheaper? Still, will it be still cheap? Will it? Can it happen? Then the another thing is the pump storage power plants. The pump storage technique is that where we have a power plant where the pump generated water from the uh, lower reservoir is pumped up using electricity. So during the off-peak, we'll pump it up. And during the peak, we use that stored water to generate electricity. So it is a cycle. But of course, the cycle efficiency is around 70%. So don't think of this as a perpetual energy machine. So every time we generate, we lose 30%. But still, if we can shift the coal power plant's uh, efficiency up, that may be another option. Generally, these pump storage plants are linked to the nuclear power plants because they cannot be uh, deloaded uh, even as much as coal power plants. And even pump storage power plants can be used for this intermittency. During, during you connect with the winds uh, intermittency, changing wind power to change the pumping of the hydropower plant or the other way. 
which the European countries they are doing, they are starting to do it. And also maybe hydropower plants further use. So that is one thing with the demand. It's coming to seven o'clock. So I think we have talked, if I were to summarize the power sector, the importance of thinking about the numbers, where they are, not the exact numbers, and Sri Lanka's capacities, the hydrothermal amounts, the issues in the power sector, the delay, delays in the power plants, implementations, the environmental aspects, the loss, the uh, costs, the implications of subsidies and below cost selling, the, in, the linkage of petroleum, CEB, and the banks, the demand, the demands variation with the daily patterns of the country, the less industrialization that is shown by the demand curve, the applications of the demand curve which we can see the type of economic development that the country is having and the repercussions of the uh, demand curve on the CB's ability to and the economics of CB or the finances of CB and the country, what are the improvements we can do and the improvements how that will be affected, the consequences of those improvements, are they feasible and also we talked about the history of electricity which is just for information and also the electricity system how it is started from one end to the other, how it is brought, the Mahavalikan, the hydro and the uh, power, hydropower and the irrigation and the water demand, the tri cornered uh, multifaceted requirement of water, the use of that, the multifaceted use in Laksapana which is for water, for town water and power and in the other hand in Mahavali which is for irrigation and power, the financial aspects of it, the rupee costs and the social impacts. So those are the issues in the power and also the investment, the difficulty of investment because power investments are high, the, the issue of private investment, the requirement of it because the government cannot fund it, but the implications of having private investment. So those are the things that we talked about. I know you want to go, but maybe five minutes we can have questions you have. I think the the sources I have put up here, of course the answering the paper, this is something that I told previously also. Please practice writing answers. We are all engineers. We find it very difficult to write long answers. That is what is there in the uh, paper, the B paper. It is analyzing. Even though we can think of the answers when you are going to write it, you will find it difficult. So please write at least four question papers. That is what I mean is all the 10 questions, if there are 10, I don't know how many are there and write it at least four question papers and go through the, your lessons, uh, through your lectures because it's from the lectures. I think that the questions are linked and the English. We all know that it is not our language, it is somebody else's language, but unfortunately we have to use it. So please, I, I, when is your exam in March? Okay, you have two months. Do your best to improve your English because I know it. You you should improve it. Simple and write simple English short sentences. Don't write long sentences. But I am saying here to to people who have some difficulty in the language. Of course, efficient pro professionally people who can write professionally, it's okay. But otherwise, because we write to try to write all the things that are in our mind in the same sentence, don't do it. There, uh, the response I have from paper making people is that they find your, that the English is not enough. So don't get discouraged by it. My answer is go for simple English, as simple as what Talahena Mahavidyala is there, Sena is under the tree. That type of English is enough rather than trying on to difficult English because what I understand is what you are write, write, writing, trying to say is not being understood by the uh, paper marking people. So that will be bad. And also use of capitals, I mean that is another response that I heard and handwriting. Now we all are culpable for that, I know that even we can't read what we write but at least for the exam you should <laughs> write so that the person who is marking the paper can read it. These are more important maybe than that electricity lecture because 
these are things that we think we can do but where we have a lacking because we have all we are not oriented in that way we would like to finish up in some sums and put the answers and the recommendation that's all in a report manner maybe with some graphs okay but this type of but it's important because once you go up in the that also it is this analysis that is important and we should be able to put it in writing so please try that if you have one or two questions maybe not okay people may want to go if you have one or two questions i will answer